Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to our brand new webinar season. Even though we didn't have a break, uh, September is somehow always good for a fresh start. So we prepared a lot of new interesting topics and guests for upcoming webinars. My name is Tamara, and I welcome you on behalf of myself and InterVenture. We are a Swiss company that builds tailor-made distributed teams for our partners. We like to say that we are something like engineering fuel for your visions. There are 240 of us and we are both based in Belgium. Uh, today, I have a great pleasure to introduce to you Igor Spasic, who will talk about the dark side of microservices. Even though I don't have this, this Morgan Freeman voice, I tried at least. <laughs> Igor will share with us some um, uh, what are common mistakes uh, and uh, things that no one is telling you about and how not to ruin your project. So listen carefully and use this opportunity to ask him anything you would like to know. And who is Igor? Uh, well, he's a software engineer and if I may say he's a renaissance multi-talented person. Igor codes, he writes, he makes beautiful photos, uh, he has that crazy energy and he's always ready for action for new projects and creating values for different communities. Uh, older generations may know him as a founder of JavaSpace, uh, then uh, HipSpace, then HipCon, and uh, numerous tech initiatives uh, with aim to share knowledge and connect uh, bright ideas and people. Uh, for questions, uh, you can use chat or Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel from tomorrow. I'll post the link uh, in chat box to our webinar playlist uh, where you might find something interesting for you. And now uh, I will stop here and give Igor some space to open the topic and um, that we all gathered here for. Enjoy and prepare to hear something new and interesting. Igor, welcome. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Here is my little <laughs> friend also welcoming to you. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, he likes to talk about dark things, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to start to sharing my presentation. Okay, cool. Okay, hi, hello everyone. Um, today we are going to talk about our things. Okay, so first thing, I'm going to cheat, okay? So I, I'm sorry for that, but uh, the thing is, um, Everything that I'm going to say today, you actually know. Um, you will not get anything life-changing today, I'm sorry. <laughs> you will not learn anything. I'm just going to remind you about what microservices are and uh, you know what kind of uh, things you have to do when you're dealing with microservices. Um, so let's see if you're ready, if you're ready to go you know, and to break some monolith, right? Yeah, you're ready. Okay, cool. So in the perfect world, how it looks like on, on paper, like microservices is like everything great, right? I mean, at the end, all the big companies like, uh, I don't know, Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, Uber, I don't know, name it. They're using microservices, right? So, so I guess you should use them too, right? There are so many benefits, right? I mean, they are great. There are so many things they, they give, give you, right? Like um, you can optimize resources because now you scale whatever you want in the way you you need um uh, then you can you can have a continuous delivery for example or or your microservices can be polyglot right you can write them in different languages or using different technologies you can scale your even development team if you want and so and so on right and then you know when you want to try something like that and go to this adventure you see on the internet like people saying something like this and then you start to worry right and what i want to talk about is not only this what you see on the screen actually i think there is more things that you have to worry about right and this is our presentation today uh, the dark side of microservices and i'm going to tell you a story this is all going to be uh, i'm going to share my my experience or my failures <laughs> doing with microservices in different environments right um Many things I'll, I will probably, you know, just skip. Uh, but so I just want to, you know, emphasize things that I really see as, as an issue, right, on, 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 this, on this path. So um, I used to work in some, uh, on, on my, my very first project dealing with microservices that was some time ago. 
and we had everything, you know, on the paper, everything looked great. And the idea was to create some kind of uh, infrastructure for developers to build, like, like Heroku, let's say. And um, everything should work, you know, everything should work, right? On paper, everything was fine. However, we have issues, like what, what can go wrong with this kind of situation? So after some time about thinking about what's, what can go wrong and what did go wrong and, and you know, what experience on other places, I came with the following slide, not this one, but the following. So this is the right moment so you, you can take your camera and take a photo of the slide <laughs> because this is actually the whole point of the presentation and I'm going to spoil my own talk, yes. Um, so, and you can leave after that, of course, if you want. I mean, it's useful late today. So what I found out that microservices uh, give you some technology, techno, technolo, technological, uh, uh, not only freedom, but um, features, you know, that you, you didn't have before. However, the main issue that I find out that with microservices is organizational, not only technical, but organizational. And on this place, on this moment, actually, I, I want to share one, one, uh, one, one slide that I want to put in every presentation of mine. And it, it's this one. This is something I keep repeating and keep finding out like uh, um, that it's true. That organization must create when microservices are, when we apply actually this law to the microservice based application or product, let's say, the organization itself must create uh, cross-functional teams where all sides or parts of the organization are actually uh, must work together. So business, marketing, I don't know, developers, they must work closely together in order to get the full potential of microservices. This is something new for, for uh, than before, than we had with, with, uh, with the monoliths. Okay, and now I will go and talk about uh, more concrete stuff. Starting with isolation. The whole idea about microservices that is that each microservice uh, should be isolated, right? And when I say isolated, I mean the whole life cycle of it should be isolated. And um, it means that you, 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 your, your team that works on one microservice should be able to independently develop and later, of course, publish microservice to production at the end. And that's the idea behind the loose coupled components that you want to have. Like in monoliths, you, you try to achieve and to have loosely coupled com components. You here also want to try to have uh, is uh, isolated microservices. But again, not only in a software, uh, um, software domain also in, in this organiz organizational domain. One little uh, thing that I like to have, and it's like so stupid, but I, I really like it, is that to have unified project interface. This is a term that I coined, so you will not find it anywhere. Uh, my, my, my idea was that each microservice has its own way, how, the, the same way how you build uh, test, um, deploy, uh, publish, uh, the, uh, whatever, uh, uh, and publish. And you can do that, for example, either by using a make file or using a, a simple bash scripts uh, that are named the same. And why, why this is cool? Because I can, I can then download or, or clone <laughs> any microservice out there and run it uh, in the same way I, as I run my own. So I don't have to learn about new JavaScript uh, building tool that comes out like every month or something like that. I can simply rely and, and just use the, the same commands from let's say command line and, and to do that. So that's one little thing that I like. Uh, versioning of microservices is like super cool and important thing, especially when you need to address dependencies between microservices, like what is the downstream and upstream dependency. This is something you must think from the very first day. And you can, you can use tools like, I mean tools, specifications like Sender, but this is not enough. The Sender is only, you know, it will only give you just the way how you uh, versioning one microservice, but you need to be able to, to, to uh, um, somehow take care about dependencies between, between these loose coupled microservices, right? 
and to track all that. And it's interesting, there is no such tool like Maven, you know, for, for microservices. There are some, I even wanted to create one tool like that, that can actually manage the, 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 the versions of microservices in, in this. But, but uh, for now, we don't have something like that. Uh, publishing itself is um, also important thing when you create a microservice. And of course, this is a place when, when you need to automate. And microservices gives you a lot of opportunities to automate things, and you should really take uh, that advantage. But of course, you must post, put some effort first to, to get this all automation, right? Um, and uh, one nice, let's say, a test for your architecture is that uh, are you able to publish one single microservice, you know, just like that? And that's cool if you can do that manually because some, I, I often see that people always have some step, like one or two steps that are done manually. Um, and here I like to talk about one, one particular um, case of Stack Overflow. Some years ago, they had some kind of uh, bug regarding some regular expression. And what happened is that microservice that was actually um, parsing some question, it got stuck. Right, and then their system realized this microservice stopped, and then they uh, th the same job uh, was assigned to another instance of microservice, and the same thing happened. Right, and very soon the the, the whole, I mean, probably the most part of Stack Overflow was down. Um, what's cool about that? It's not about that it's down. It's that they solved the issue in 30 minutes. When they solved the issue, when they say they solved the issue, it means they figure out there isn't a problem, okay? So have, they had a very good monitoring. Then they actually fixed the bug that took some time. They, uh, that's, let's say, okay. And they, they will be able to publish this fix to production and all that in 30 minutes. I mean, my pizza is not coming in 30 minutes when I order it. <laughs> and, and, but, but those guys were, were able to, to do that and they are probably still able to do that in, in like 30 minutes or about 30 minutes. So for me, for me, that was like super achievement of their organization. Okay, now back to the development or let's go further to the development itself. Uh, to be honest, I didn't find um, um, microservice project that uh, has local development done correctly or at least how I see it's correct. Um, meaning that uh, there is always some time, some kind of waiting or, or some things the developer have to, must do and they shouldn't, right? I mean, developers should develop, right? Not wait for something or, or, or something like that. And one thing, uh, one thing, uh, one thing that I like to emphasize about development is that you know when you talk uh, uh, do microservices, is something that, uh, that you're actually talking using APIs. And another story I like to mention here is that in one company in 2002, uh, their CEO they uh, he sent an email and told told everyone in the email, like, um, from now on, we are only using the HTTP calls and we are only using APIs to communicate between each other. And who, who and he literally said, who is not doing like that, he will be fired or, I don't know, burned down or, or whatever. And this company was Amazon. And, and actually, I like this kind of, uh, to think about that, about this kind of approach, right? and um, where they really want to use the API all the way, all the way, uh, all the way, right? Now, when we talk about APIs, right, we must not forget that we are using APIs, actually that we are using HTTP calls. So API call may fail. So I will repeat this again. <laughs> API call may fail, fail. Um, this is simply nature of API calls. Why this is important? Because Usually when you use APIs in microservices, they are usually wrapped in some kind of client that's, and when you use this client, this client looks like a common Java code, for example, or whatever language you're using. And people are often forget that you're using the, the, the API or HTTP call, right? And if you find yourself in a situation that you have some kind of loop and you're calling a, a microservice uh, other API in a loop, it's, it looks okay from the, programming language point of view, like you're just doing, you know, like loop and calling some method, but it's not okay from the 
microservice point of view because that should tell you that uh, you probably need a different API to call that will do all this you know loop on the microservice side not on your side right and um, when when we're also talking about the APIs there are many reasons why some API can can uh, fail like it, HTTP call can fail and uh, fail and this these are just few few fallacies that you know people forget when they when they when they do HTTP um, and I had I had one 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 such issue for example that we are use, we were using a synchronous uh, web server and um, and it means that uh, is, it was using only several threads. This is how it works, opposite like to Tomcat, where, where, where that, that's using like, I don't know, hundreds of threads for um, uh, getting uh, requests and, and returning response. In this uh, server, you only have few, because this is how it works, Neo and, and that stuff, asynchronous calls. And the, 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 the guys who were responsible for this microservice, they, they, they were calling themselves because they were, I don't know why, but they are calling this the, themselves. And what was the result of it? Um, as soon as this code hits the production and the load gets a little bit higher, we got the deadlock, right? Because um, um, it was it called in sales, but the, the same thread was waiting for itself to to return, and it, there was a deadlock, right? And yeah, th that's a problem. And one thing about uh, uh, the issue with the HTTP. Uh, it's addressed in, in, in companies that are using microservices. And one like popular thing is, it was developed, I think, in Netflix. They started to switch down various servers or they started to add some latency in the communication and so on, you know, just in production, trying to see what's going on, what will go, you know, what, what would happen if this happens in, you know, uh, for real. And this led to, I think this group was called Chaos Monkeys or something like that. And they, they were responsible for doing that. And they had some fun, I guess, at the end. And that led to completely new uh, way of testing uh, that, that's applied in microservices. I'm going to talk uh, about more about that. That's called like chaos testing. Uh, that actually does that thing. You know, each of these points that you see on screen is, uh, can be somehow simulated. I mean, the failure of it can be simulated and your microservice infra infrastructure and architecture must be resilient, must survive these kind of things. Okay, going further, local development, I said, it can be really tough, okay? So why? Um, when you have a little number of microservices, that's okay, but when you develop a microservice and then you have some downstream dependencies and upstream dependencies, how you're going to run that locally, for example? How are you going to test that? Test that. This. Uh, are you going to use the mocks for the needed dependent microservices, or um, how you? Uh, what's going to be uh, the 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 artifact of your uh, repository? Are, is it going to be like Maven jar, or is it going to be um, a WAR file or tar file, whatever? Or are or are we going to use Docker, for example, or create a Docker image itself and then push the Docker like like the last one? Personally, I like to go to the Docker, uh, to that area, trying to, so every every microservice artifact of every microservice is a Docker image. This way, I have unified my, uh, unified artifacts that comes from microservices, right? But then again, you have to be aware that you need to keep down and track down the versions that you don't have in Docker world. I mean, you have the, the tags, right? But you have manually to, to, to manage dependencies. So imagine if you have some kind of cloud uh, and, and several microservices and, and you want to, to run it locally, that's ain't gonna happen. I mean, most of the time, right? So you need to think uh, creative, let's say, ways how you, how you develop locally efficiently. Uh, documentation is super important, of course, like always, and nobody's, <laughs> nobody's um, uh, actually paid attention maybe at the end, but the thing here is um, you need to document your API, right? And there is no reason why not to use open API standards and like, like Swagger. And um, uh, you need not only to uh, define the endpoints, but it's very cool to define the examples how your API is intended to be used, right? 
and also to document or specify upstream and downstream dependencies. How you can do that? You can do that sometimes even in some text file where you write it down. That's like one more simple way to do, but then you have, you simply have, you need to have this kind of uh, thing that, 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 pros, uh, that pays attention about dependencies. And finally, about development, uh, you need to communicate a lot, more lot than you have a monolith, let's say application. And Slack, I said, uh, Slack is often used in communication, right? And this is not only uh, related to microservices, maybe this is also related to other kind of projects, but the thing is that you need to be sure that uh, correct information is uh, comes to all developers, right? All, or all parties. And what happens on Slack, especially if you work in different time zones is that um, some messages simply can get lost, you know, and then you see like lot, some important message and I don't know, a lot of uh, message about cats and weekend vacation and I don't know, somebody had a birthday and you, you lost a very important message. Um, message. So that's why I, I don't find Slack like the only, only tool for co communication. I, I like like old school things, not, not because I'm old school, <laughs> because they, they still work like email. Um, so basic, but, but still you need to be sure that to communicate all the changes, especially in the APIs. And one particularly important thing about development are states, right? And when we are doing microservices, we are somehow, uh, we start to think in uh, non, in, in stateless way. Well, I, in, and that's cool, right? If you have a stateless uh, microservice, it's great because you can easily scale, right? You can just fire up several instances and it will work. But you sometimes cannot, cannot get, uh, and you, you sometimes you really need states. And you have to think about how to solve that. And fortunately, these things are solved and uh, you should implement them. And that's additional work that you need to be aware of how to implement these states and to be sure that there is no intermediate states state in your data store, let's say, that is still, that is available or accessible by the application. So this is something, so when I say don't, I, I'm joking, of course. So yes, do use states, think about them when there, when there is a need to do that. But definitely you have to do, do more work now, especially when these states goes across several microservices. Okay, now let's go for testing. One thing that I also realized is that integration is like new, new unit test. And there is uh, the challenges here with integration testing is that you need to somehow test more than one microservice. Um, that I don't say that you will you need to ditch unit tests. No, you will still have unit tests, but integration becomes more more. Let's say I mean it's always important, but now you will doing it more. Um, and uh, here you will see all the pain that I mentioned when you have local development. So how would you going? How are you going to test um, microservice that depend on several other ones, right? Are you sure that you're getting the right version of the downstream dependencies or, um, and so on. And if you have like CICD and the integration tests are sure for sure the part of it, uh, sometimes I, and actually I often notice that it takes time, right? So should you only integ uh, run integration tests on your microservice to speed up? Because would you like to wait for, I don't know, 15 minutes or one hour just integration tests to, 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 to be over? And believe me, that happened. That happens in, in real life projects. No, you don't want to do that, right? You want to, you need to optimize that. And this is again, additional work that you usually didn't have a, a need to think much about it. Another thing that I especially like, and uh, I, I, to be honest, I don't have much experience about it, but I would like to put in that, uh, you know, um, in, in start doing that as soon as possible is testing in production. So the idea behind this concept is the following. Uh, failures are going to happen. That's it. You, 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 will, you will not be able to um, remove the failures. Failures are part of your living and running application, especially in the world, like I said, microservices where, where you have all this communication over, over such connection like HTTP, right? So failures are going to happen. 
pre-production tests might be superficial, right? Because you cannot uh, simulate the behavior or, or of the users or the load of the users or whatever is the real um, load on the system, right? There is really no way how you can predict that in front. And maybe the only way how you can test your system with real load is to have it in production. And this little slide, it, 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 it takes a lot of things with it, right? Because with good tests in production, it means that you're able not only to um, find the issue, right? You need to be able to figure out the issue very soon. You need to be uh, able to fix the issue also very soon or to isolate the microservice version if you have like green, uh, blue green deployment to isolate that again very promptly so end users don't face that issue, uh, that, that bug, right? So there is many things that you need to prepare and to be ready just to be able to test in production, right? So it's not an easy thing, definitely. And uh, a similar topic, but I like to uh, also emphasize it is stressing, stressing because uh, although you you can't uh, predict the the real load, but you should you should stress your microservices, right? And with stress, I don't mean just like you know just give some load and that's it. No, think about stress like a, like a test or proof that your microservices work under certain condition. When one of the boundaries of this uh, work is, uh, let's say, the response time. Right. So define the, the, the expected traffic on each microservice. Define that in the front and then prove that by stressing them, right? Because it's, that's the goal, right? You, you need to, be, to, to know what are the limits of your microservices. And probably the most uh, broader topic is architecture. And there are several things, and again, we can talk about a lot of uh, about microservice architecture. I mean, this that's, that's in like an endless, endless talk. But here are a few things. And the most important thing, I guess, with microservices is what is a microservice? Where are the boundaries of microservice? And that's that's a, that's a thing that you can bang your head on all the time. And I will not give you any super smart answer, right? I try to think them as uh, I try to think about uh, business requirements, functionalities. I don't think about like a particular small set of functionalities, like small number of it. I'm, I, I like to think about the domain and what is like a self-sufficient uh, set of functionalities that belongs to a microservice. And uh, since also you probably you, especially in the beginning, you probably will not be able to, to draw these boundaries easily. That's why I say that's okay, but just be ready and prepared to change that, right? Don't stick to exist to, to, first, uh, to first architecture that comes to your mind, right? Be ready to something that I call aggressive refactoring. It's not so aggressive as it sounds, but I just like this concept, you know, that, that you start small and in baby steps you, you grow, right? And the same thing can be applied here. If you're not sure, that's okay. Just start with something, and then probably you will see and be able to see how how interaction goes with that microservice, and then you will see should it be uh, I don't know two split in two microservices or not, right? And think about single responsibility pro uh, principle, the something that comes from or you know common programming uh, practices, right? Because what you want to avoid is microservices that are actually monoliths in disguise, right? You don't want that. Um, and one, one let, let's say, test is if your application requires all microservices to be deployed together, then, then it's probably not microservice architecture, right? Then it's, again, some kind of big monolith with distributed components that are talking through HTTP. So think about that. There is not an easy answer, and it's actually up to you to, 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 to define the answer for yourself and for your project. Uh, common common pattern that comes in architecture, let's say, is that you're going to probably need, actually you will definitely need some kind of even driven architecture or even driven um, whatever you're going to use. Uh, it gives definitely a loose couple, uh, um, it definitely lose couple uh, components. Uh, um, it splits uh, them to be uh, really tight together. 
and improves the readability, right? But even driven um, programming itself comes with certain issues itself. It's like, um, uh, it's very hard to do parallel processing, for example, or some messages can be um, missed or even get, uh, there can be a failure of reading or accepting messages. And uh, user experience uh, is very important here because you need to think now about the progress because uh, you know, even driven is not something that comes like immediately, right? You, there, there is some kind of uh, progress processing that and failures as well. Something that you may, you don't have if, you, if you're not using even driven approach. And one example that I have is like this. Imagine that you have like simpli simpli simplified, you have some API gateway, Every, everything comes to this gateway. And let's say you have a user microservice and then you have a chat microservice. Uh, so now you, you need some user change his, I don't know, nickname. And, and user microservice needs to tell to chat microservice that nickname has been changed, right? And you want to do that in real time. How you do that? Should user microservice talk to chat microservice? No. Why? Because this way I'm, I'm, I'm explicitly connecting chat with the user microservice. And user actually in this, in this uh, solution, user must be aware that there is a chat microservice. You don't want that. Instead, you will put in the middle uh, some kind of queue, uh, message queue, and user change on user microservice will be announced there as an event. And then a chat microservice would, you know, just get and read this uh, uh, event and do accordingly what it has to do, right? Um, you probably know about CAP. Theorem, 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 God, what's the name in English? <laughs> My English is maybe not the best, so, uh, okay. You can, you can make fun of me later. Um, so, um, uh, this theorem essentially gives you two options. Uh, yeah, your system can be either uh, open for avail availability or consistency. And while there are some places where consistent architecture needs to be achieved, and they are, it's important to have. I, I think all of other cases are going towards to using the A of Cape Theorem, the availability, right? And, and, and this is totally reasonable. And you have also to think about in that direction. I, I totally believe, I, I like, like 100%. Meaning, and th there is even research on the internet, uh, I, 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 maybe even several research the, um, about uh, how humans actually perceive some kind of um, uh, web application or application. And it happens that humans um, uh, rather would have an answer, like response right now, immediately, as soon as possible, rather to have a correct answer. That's very interesting. So that's the idea of, of, uh, behind this uh, uh, slide, to use something like that, to use a system that it's not right all the time, but it's all the time available and responsive to the end user. And you have to think about that. And here is an example. I think there was a question about that in, uh, in chat. It popped up quickly. Uh, one thing how you can achieve that is with CQRS, for example, using. And not necessary meaning that you have to use the even source. For example, you can use the CQRS even, even without that. Um, even source is just naturally coming very, uh, let's say, easily on CQRS. So what we have here is that uh, uh, on the on the bottom you have the part that is responsible for writing, right? And you have a special API for writing, and it goes directly to database, and that's it. The whole point here is just to write the data to the master storage. On the other side, on the upside, we have the the query part where you just do the reading and this elastic search that is upstairs uh, is getting uh, updated periodically not necessary uh, in the in the same moment when data is there and it's even cool that you can even delete everything in elastic and it should be able to recover right because it should be able to fetch all the data i mean sure it will have it will need more time for that for sure but it will be possible to do that right 
So this is one, one way how you can uh, easily split things. Even though if you don't use like SQLRS and, and split the, 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 the APIs for queries and writing, you can still do the same thing on the backend, meaning like having a, a different, uh, let's say, a data source for reading and writing. And there is one another, another uh, pattern that I like to, to mention here that I didn't try by myself, but I think it's an interesting one. It's called BFF. Um, it's not your best friend forever. <laughs> it's your backend to frontend pattern. And the whole idea here is to reduce the APIs and to uh, align them to the usage. Meaning if you have a different type of users, uh, let's say you have a two different type of web applications or I don't know, you have a desktop application and web application, they will probably uh, require different APIs. One will, desktop application, for example, might fetch more data. Uh, web application might be, might maybe uses only GraphQL, for example, and, and so on. And it's totally okay, for example, to have like this simple dummy layer between the backend and the API, uh, the frontend that's, uh, that has only APIs that is uh, made for the particular particular uh, uh, client that you have. And this way, the goal here is to remove the, the, the big APIs. That's the thing that I saw actually in, in practice, that API grow, grow, grow a lot, just to be able to, uh, to cover all the cases that, that were needed by the one client. And one thing that, that cannot be uh, put on one slide and, and maybe uh, it can go in 10 slides. It's the infrastructure behind that. That's for me also part of the architecture here in microservices. And it has a lot inside, meaning like logging. Logging is like huge traffic on one uh, project we have in debug mode, like maybe 20 or 30% of all networking was just logging. Uh, going to Fluent, uh, writing everything down. Uh, we used to have some logging to files and um, Amazon was throwing IO exception because he was not able to quickly enough uh, flush uh, all the stuff to the files. Um, and uh, you need, not to, and with such huge amount of logs, you need to be able to provide your developers an easy way to get and log of their errors, meaning that logs need to be separated per instance, for example. And, um, and because sometimes the log is the only thing that you see and it tells you that something is wrong, right? And then you, all your instances need to be scalable, right? Independently. Uh, monitoring is story for itself. You need to be able to monitor smartly everything was going on to detect, for example, slow IOs. In one example, one, um, uh, uh, our microservices were used for 100%, CPU was used like 100% of time for some, I don't know, maybe weeks until we figure out that uh, somebody was mining Bitcoins. <laughs> uh, and that was like a great idea, but uh, uh, this is something that you don't want to be done on your microservices, right? So monitoring is very, very important to be done on the day one. And everything what I say on this slide should be, should be there on day one. Then you need to, to do tracing, for example, how you're going to trace your call from the front end all the way to the back end. It's not that hard. You can, you can use some kind of header for that, uh, traceable headers and stuff. How you're going to organize blue and green deployment, meaning especially how you're going to organize versions. Let's say if you have a mobile application and then old version of APIs must be still there in separate instances, meaning that your HA proxy or any proxy needs to be aware of the versions itself and, and, and redirect traffic to that, to other ones, and so on and so on and so on. So it's a long thing, and most of these things you really have to have as soon as possible. And after all that, I mean, you must be overwhelmed, right? And um, so I'm going just to finish with seven deadly sins of microservices. Um, that I find out that are commonly repeating and I actually find them on also on internet. So it's, it was quite um, a nice way to, 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 to end this. Um, this. This comes often and not only with microservices and uh, we developers tend to think that uh, using the latest tech is going to solve all the issues in the world. Um, actually, that's not going to happen. Then you should use appropriate technology. 
the good thing about the microservices that I emphasize again is ability to have a separate development processes, meaning separate development languages. So if you have a team that's fluent in Kotlin or Scala, you can allow them to use the, this tool, let's say programming language or technologies they know, or they want to explore more if you have such you know, opportunity to, to, to do. That's for me super cool. Um, um, this is, thing is about protocol. There is so many protocols that I even didn't, I was not aware of. Um, starting with HTTP, protobuf, I don't know, uh, Trift, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, easy, easy, it's easy to, to go and, and start using them all because they are there. You want to use them all, right? No, uh, it would be cool if you can use one synchronous and one asynchronous protocol. For example, you can use one, let's say, JSON over HTTP or use some RabbitMQ for a synchronous protocol and stick to that, to your project, if it's possible, right? This one is, I think, uh, bigger than people actually appreciate, meaning it's about organization. That's, I'm emphasizing it again. Microservices require, or actually uh, gives an impact organization to organization, people, and even cultural feed, uh, impact to, to, to your company, right? And this is something that you need to address as well. And uh, the whole idea here is you want to get your shit done, right? You want to get your application working, right? And you need to communicate. You need to up your organization to be also um, ready for microservices. It's not only technical issue. Uh, we talked about that. It's too easy to become a monolith because we are lazy. Sometimes developers are lazy and they, they create something nice. Uh, but sometimes developers are lazy and they don't do something nice. They, especially in microservices, we try to find like a shortcut and start to, you know, put things in, in, in one microservice that becomes a huge monolith and that's it. Uh, or you simply, for example, have two, two uh, microservices that you cannot uh, deploy independently, for example. Or, um, yeah, or, or you're using the same design principles that you're using for monoliths to the microservices. As we, see in this, uh, as we have seen in this, uh, this presentation, there are a lot of things that, that you need to consider just, just for architecture, for microservice architecture. Um, as I told you, uh, microservices are going to be run on, on, on distributed systems, right? And failure is going to happen. And you need to be aware of that. And you need to program that also in your code. You need to put things like uh, um, uh, toler fault tolerant patterns, like uh, uh, timeouts, like uh, repeats, like, uh, I don't know, circuit breakers, uh, bulkheads that I actually never use that you can vertically split the whole microservices um, uh, together. So if one, one, one this uh, uh, pillar stops, the other works, right? And in general, you need to embrace this kind of DevOps ment uh, mentality behind it. Uh, this is one thing that I also noticed that uh, domains are shared among, among the microservices. Uh, I, I mean domain models, they shouldn't. Right, they should have their own living. Otherwise, they are going to be the part that, that that's going to connect all microservices, and they are not going to be loose coupled, right? And seventh, sin, testing that I that I already mentioned, but I'm um, you know emphasizing again. It's very difficult to to get. Uh, to get things uh, tested in the same way how it's going to be used in production when you have microservices. And I think the only effective way basically is to, to allow these kind of tests in production. And if you think differently, then you really have to have a proof that your kind of testing is somehow applicable to, to, to or, or measurable to what's going to be in, in, in production, right? And my conclusion, so um, as you saw on the first slide, my, my realization on the very beginning that microservices have a huge impact on, on organizational structure. There is certain conclusion that I believe that 
is related to, let's say, development and technology way of thinking. So as I see it, being a great developer is not enough here. And with monoliths, you're allowed to do many shortcuts. And you can, you can, you can allow yourself that, that moment when you say, okay, I don't have to do that right now. I will do that in one month. Or I'm now focused on this. With microservices, it's different. With microservices, uh, you need to be a great engineer. And by engineer, I mean a person or let's say a team that thinks more from day one that thinks about all the things that I have said here. And you need to have an answer for each actually slide that I show you today on, and much more. You need to be sure why you choose something and how you're going to go and be okay to, to you know, to, to make a, a mistake and then, you know, fix it and so on. So you have to think more, but from day one. And that's something that's different. And you need to be ready for that. So that's it. That's basically it. I'm Igor, like uh, you know, and um, thank you for time. And if you have any question, thank you. Can... Uh, we had the uh, we had two questions uh, in uh, chat. I will read the first one. Uh, mm -hmm. When you say upstream and downstream dependencies, do you mean the same terms in as in DDD? Uh, mm, yes, let's say. Uh, technically speaking, uh, I see it uh, simpler in the, same, in, the, in the sense like upstream, uh, downstream dependencies, simply microservices that you depend on and upstreams are those that depend on you. Like, it's simpler like that. It's just dependency that you're, so you're using a microservice and other microservices using you. So that's it. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think you already answered this question, but I will just read it again. What's your take on uh, CQRS and event, event sourcing and uh, CAP theorem kick in? What's hap what happens when we need to have some parts of system always up? Yeah, that's I that's a coward basically. Um, if you need a system to go to be up, you need to provide different architectural patterns. Like like I told you, these boundaries. There there are several ways how you do that. Basically, you you just. Um, uh, have more redundant uh, system in that case that that has to be more up. That, I mean, that, but that's that's actually the point of microservices, right? With all these new instances and and it, to be able to scale, right? Okay. Um, if anybody has uh, any more questions, you can type in a chat box or Q and A option. I will just post the link here in chat box, as I said, for um, our YouTube playlist, and. Um, if uh, nobody else has any more questions, um, I will say uh, thank you all for being here with us. Thank you, Igor, for coming and um, being here uh, in this webinar. Um, our next event will be in October, and uh, we will discuss uh, with several speakers uh, what are the challenges of working with the distributed teams and how to choose the right partner and how to take the best uh, of in-house and outsourcing way of working. Uh, until then, check out career page. Maybe there's something interesting waiting for you. I will also post um, the link uh, in a chat box here. Uh, uh, we have one more question. Did you maybe regret in some situation when developing microservices? Yes, <laughs> yes that, that first example that they mentioned. Well, actually, most of this, what I mentioned today, actually happened, these dark things. Um, and... I regret mostly the not technical things, but these kind of organizational things that, you know, when you have to wait without any reason and stuff like that. But regarding the architecture, uh, I see that it's always solvable, right? So any 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 challenge we have, it's solvable, right? But I, I'm regretting mostly like there was not enough, um, let's say, energy, or I don't know how else to say, or or will. To, to, to solve these issues, right? So, sure, sometimes uh, I have like a project that can be, for example, monolith. It wouldn't hurt anybody, uh, but you know, it's not like I'm regretting that. I mean, it's even not my decision, so, <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, well, I guess we will just round this up with this question. 
thank you again. Um, have a nice evening and we will see you again soon. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Thanks thank you, bye. Bye-bye.